بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي Continue with our book, our journey through the book of Salah, the fiqh of Salah, uh, with the author, the great Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi, rahmatullah alayhi. We reach with the author, he's speaking now about the intention as being the sixth condition that somebody needs to be aware of before they pray. So he says, Ashartu Sadis, the sixth condition, Aniyatul Salah bi Ainiha, the intention for the prayer specifically as intention for the prayer having been specified. So niya has the meaning of intention in English and in Arabic it means al-qasd. Nawaitu shay'an ay qasadtuhu. I intended something means I sought it out and I embarked upon it. The place of the niya is not upon the tongue, rather it's in the heart. It's not something that needs to be pronounced. In fact, to pronounce it, some of the ulama, such as Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, he said it's an innovation, it's something which should be avoided. The ulama, when they mention it in the books of fiqh, as we are now, we're studying fiqh, it refers to niyatul amal, the intention of the action, meaning that you are intending to differentiate between different types of acts of worship. And even within the same act of worship, like the prayer, you are differentiating between the different types of the same act of worship. Is it a fard prayer? Is it a sunnah prayer? Is it a nafal prayer? Is it a prayer that I am making up? And the like. When mentioning the books of Aqidah, the books of belief, it refers to niyatul ma'mul lahu. Niyatul ma'mul lahu. The niyat of who you are intending to serve. The intention of who you are intending to please. And in these books of Aqidah, it refers to and it reminds us that we should have our intention solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because intending other than Allah azawajal in our worship is going to be of no benefit. As in the hadith al-Qudsi collected by Imam Muslim, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated from Allah who said, Anna aghna shuraka yani shirk. I am the most self-sufficient and rich of all partners. I have no need for any partners. من أشرك من أمل أملا أشرك فيه ما يغيري تركته وشركه whoever does an action and in that action intends other an, an, another being alongside me Allah سبحانه وتعالى says I have no need for him or his action I reject both him and his action so the intention is something which is imperative to have for Allah سبحانه وتعالى alone the author he says referring to the intention ويجوز تقديمها على التكبير بالزمن اليسير إذا لم يفسخها. He said the author it's permissible to have the intention close to the time of doing the takbir. يعني it doesn't have to be before a long time before you make the takbir. It's it's allowed to have it close to the time of the first takbir in the salah, as long as you don't break the intention between the time you intend and the time you start the salah. So the 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 niyyah is one of those. Uh, like all shart, all of the conditions, they have to be there present throughout the salah. It has to be from the beginning to the end of the salah. So the author is saying it's allowed to have the intention closer to the uh, first takbir. And this is in fact a better case, that the person should have the intention as close as possible to the first takbir. The intention has to be firm for the specific prayer which you are about to pray. And as we said, it's not something which you state upon the tongue, it's upon the heart. It's in the heart that you know what you are about to do, you know why you are standing up, you know that you are going to pray this specific prayer for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If one is in the prayer and they have something which is taraddud, taraddud is that they have doubt. Shall I break the prayer or shall I not break the prayer? Maybe somebody is praying and they're talking to themselves, the pizza is burning in the oven, shall I go and break the prayer or shall I not break the prayer? So they have this back and forth within themselves uh, with, with regards to the intention, whether they should continue or not. In a situation like this, then the salah is considered as being void. Why? Because the intention has to have what is known as jazm. It has to be jazim and it has to be solid and, and continual throughout the prayer. There can't be this back and forth, this doubt or this um, back and forth decision. Should I break it? Should I not break it? It has to be firm from the beginning of the prayer to the end of the prayer. Also with regards to intentions, one, if needed to, if there's a need, can change the intention from fard 
from an obligatory prayer to a non-obligatory prayer if there is a need. An example of this, if somebody comes to the masjid and the congregation has already finished the prayer. So this person has entered the masjid and the congregation has finished the prayer. So the person starts to pray. <coughs> the person starts to pray. And then another congregation, a group, start to pray in front of this person. So it's allowed for this person in this situation to change from the fard that they were praying, the obligatory prayer, to a nafal prayer, to a voluntary prayer as an intention, and to quickly complete that prayer and then go and join the congregation. Because to pray with the congregation has a lot more reward. Okay, so this is what some of the ulama they said. Also, they mentioned a situation where you may want to change your intention if there's a need from an obligatory prayer to a nafal prayer. Is if, let's say, for example, you're in um, a masjid at the airport and you have a flight to catch, and the imam is making a very long prayer, which he shouldn't do in such a place. So, in this situation, you can change from your intention, you can change your intention from being the ma'moon, the follower, to the munfarid, to the one who prays individually. So you can change your intention from praying behind the Imam to pray it now individually and you can break away and complete your prayer in such a situation. If you're in need to catch a flight or maybe you're sick and the Imam is making the prayer too long for you. So that's what we want to mention with regards to the intention. And there's going to be more points later on in the book that we will refer back to with regards to issues of the intention. Excuse me. The author, he carries on and he says, Babu adab al ila salah chapter pertaining to the, to the mannerisms of how you would walk to the masjid. The reason the ulama, they mention this chapter is because going to the masjid is so virtuous and in fact it's imperative upon a male Muslim that if he is in the vicinity where he can hear the adhan, then he has to respond to the adhan. And when we say hear the adhan, we don't mean the adhan on the microphones, that which you can naturally hear if somebody was standing on the roof and they were to call out the adhan, if you were in the vicinity of however far that adhan would reach, some of the ulama, they say uh, three kilometers, then this is where in this vicinity, the male would have to respond to the masjid. And even the female, she's allowed, of course, to go to the masjid, as long as certain conditions are fulfilled. And going to the masjid to pray in the masjid is so virtuous, and it has so many uh, fadail. That's why the ulama, they mentioned this section in the book of prayer. So the, the, the chapter pertaining to the mannerisms of walking to the prayer. The author, he says, يُسْتَحَبُّ الْمَسْيُّ إِلَى الصَّلَىٰ It's recommended to walk to the salah, not to take your riding beast, not to take your camel, your donkey, not to ride on the back of your wife, I'm joking, not to ride in a car, it's better to walk. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari, إِذَا تَوَضَّأَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَأَحْسَنَ الْوُضُوءُ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ لَا يُخْرِجُهُ إِلَّا صَلَىٰ لَمْ يَخْتُوا خُطْوَةً إِلَّا رُفِعَتْ لَهُ بِهَا دَرَجَةً وَحُدَّ عَنْهُ بِهَا خَطِيَةً The Prophet ﷺ said if one of you makes wudu and he perfects his wudu, he or she, then they go to the masjid, nothing took them to the masjid except that they wanted to pray there, then they will not take a step except that for each step they are raised a rank in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for each step a sin is removed from them. So when one thinks about these rewards and many others connected to going to the masjid to pray, then it's something which is worth sweating over. The author, he says, Bi sakinatin wa waqar, that the person when they go to the masjid, they should have a state of sakina and waqar. These two words literally mean tranquility and humility. But the ulama, at times they say they mean the same thing and some of the ulama they say rather they have different meanings. So some of them said that sakina is not to be rushed in the prayer, that you don't rush on your way to the prayer. And the other word waqar is that you lower your gaze from anything which may be sinful. So sakina is to walk in a tranquil manner and waqar is to walk in a way that you ensure that you are not looking upon something which uh, can cause you sin. And this is something which is really dangerous because of the time that we live in today, wherever we look, even when you're trying to lower your gaze, you're, you're likely to fall upon something which is haram. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our hearing and our sight and our thoughts from that which is sinful. Ameen. So the author, he says, وَيُقَارِبُوا بَيْنَ خُطَاهُ And the person, he or she, joins between their footsteps, meaning that they make their footsteps 
as small as possible. And one may think, why would the author mention this? The author mentions this because he's a businessman who is seeking reward and profit with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the business people of this earth, they look for any way to gain further profits. They look for any way to increase their wealth. The people of the hereafter, they look for any way to gain further reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if each step going to the masjid, as we mentioned in the hadith, is raising you a rank with Allah Azawajal, and each step is removing a sin from you, then why not make your steps smaller so you get more steps to the masjid? So like this is how the righteous people, they think. The author, he says, وَلَا يُشَبِّكُ أَصَابِعَهُمْ And the person shouldn't interlock their fingers as they are going to the masjid. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Abu Dawood, إِذَا تَوَضَّأَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَأَحْسَنَ وَضُوءَهُ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ آمِدًا إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ فَلَا يُشْبِكَنَّ يَدَّيْهِ فَإِنَّهُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ The Prophet ﷺ said in this narration that if one of you makes wudu and he or she perfects their wudu, then they go to the masjid intending only to be in the masjid to pray. Then the person should not join between their hands. فَلَا يُشْبِكَنَّ They shouldn't do like so between their hands because the person is considered to be in the prayer. As long as the person is going to the pray, to the prayer, to the salah on his way, then the person is considered to be in prayer. And whilst the person is praying also, and even after the prayer, if they are staying in the masjid, they shouldn't do that. It's something which should be avoided and it's disliked to do. The author, he says, وَيَقُولُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ The person, as he's walking to the masjid, he says, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ And he says this dua that the author has mentioned. However, this dua, many of the ulama, the scholars of hadith, they said it's not authentic and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. This needs a lot of research to come to a conclusion whether the dua is authentic or not. However, there's many other authentic duas that one can say. For example, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the dua which is mentioned in the collection of hadith of Imam Muslim, Allahumma ij'al fi qalbi nur, O Allah, put in my heart light, the light of guidance and the light of iman, wa fi basari nur, and put in my sight light. وَفِي سَمْعِ نُورِ And in my hearing, in my ears put light. وَعَنْ يَمِينِ نُورِ And on my right put light. وَعَنْ يَسَارِ نُورِ And on my left put light. Until the end of the hadith. So this hadith is a beautiful dua, which one should learn if they are regularly going to the masjid, because you are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to surround you with light of guidance and light of protection and the light of iman. And uh, it's something which we uh, should beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for because we are in need of guidance for every second and moment of our lives. Uh, that hadith can be found in Sahih Muslim and it can be found in many uh, dua books like Husn al-Muslim, the fortress of the Muslim. The author, he said, فَإِذَا سَمِعَ الْإِقَامَةِ If the person, when the person hears the iqama, when the person hears the, the establishment of the prayer, not the adhan, the iqama. فَإِذَا سَمِعَ الْإِقَامَةِ لَمْ يَسْعَ إِلَيْهَا Then the person shouldn't rush towards the iqama, towards the prayer. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari, إِذَا أُقِيمَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا تَعْتُوهَا وَأَنْتُمْ تَسْعُونَ If the prayer is being established, the iqama is being established, then the person shouldn't rush to it. فَلَا تَعْتُوهَا وَأَنْتُمْ تَسْعُونَ وَأْتُوهَا وَعَلَيْكُمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَبَقَارِ فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُوا Rather you should come to the prayer in a state of tranquility and not rush. And that which you catch with the imam, then you pray. And that which, which you miss with the imam, you make up. So walking to the salah in a tranquil manner, it allows the person to have uh, more enjoyment in their prayer. Because if you rush to the prayer, it's going to take you a good five minutes to calm down. You're not going to be able to compose your thoughts, to compose your uh, state of mind as you should have. Rather, you should go to the prayer as early as possible so you can get you ready for this standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can take full benefit from the prayer. The mashur opinion in the madhab, the mashur, the popular opinion in the madhab amongst the humbly scholars is that the masbuk, the masbuk is the one who missed something from the prayer with the imam. That the masbuk, whatever he catches with the imam is considered to be the last of the prayer and not the early part of the prayer. So for example, to make this clear, if somebody is going to the masjid to pray uh, Salat al-Maghrib and they miss the first two raka'ah, they miss the first two raka'ah and they get to pray one raka'ah with the imam. So they don't make that one raka'ah that they prayed with the imam their first raka'ah. Rather that one raka'ah that they prayed with the imam is as it is in reality. It's the last raka'ah. And the first two raka'ah that were missed, they would make them up as 
they were the first two raka in the normal salah, meaning that they wouldn't sit between these two. Whereas if you follow the other opinion, which is that you the raka that you caught with the imam, you make it your first raka, then it would mean that you would have to sit after the first raka to do a tashahud and then do another raka and then a tashahud and another raka. So this opinion that we are saying that the famous opinion the more popular opinion, the mashur opinion in the madhab of the Hanbali scholars is that what you catch with the Imam is its reality, it's considered the end part of the prayer and what you missed is the early part of the prayer and that's what you have to make up. And why do they choose this opinion? Because they, ch they follow the hadith which says فَقَدُوا They follow the hadith which says complete and not atimmu, which means to make up. Okay, so that gives a difference in meaning. That was some extra information there. طيب, the author he says, وَإِذَا أُقِيمَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةِ When the iqama has been established for the prayer, there is no prayer that should be prayed except for the obligatory one. So it's not permissible for a person that when the iqama is being given, that they then start a sunnah of fajr, for example, which many people do. They come to the masjid late, the obligatory prayer is about to start, and they start to pray the sunnah. This is something which is not allowed. However, if they are already in the sunnah or a nafud prayer, they are allowed to finish that prayer quickly and they should do it quickly. Because in Surah Al-Muhammad, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasoola, wa la tubtilu a'malakum. O you who believe, be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and do not invalidate your actions. So this is one of the proofs which is used to say that if a person has already started a prayer, a nafal prayer or a sunnah prayer, then they shouldn't cut it, rather they should um, quickly finish it and then join the obligatory prayer in the congregation. The author he says, وَإِذَا أَتَى الْمَسْجِدْ قَدَّمَ رِجْلَهُ الْيُمْنَى فِي الدُّخُولِ وَقَالِ When the person gets to the masjid, they put their right foot forward, they enter with their right foot and they say, Bismillah, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ And peace and blessings be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ghfilli, O oh Allah, forgive me dhunubi. O oh Allah, forgive me my sins. Allahumma ghfilli dhunubi, forgive me my sins. وَفْتَحْ لِي أَبْوَابَ رَحْمَتِكَ And open up for me, O oh Allah, the doors of your mercy. So this reminds us that mercy, tranquility and guidance is found in the masjid. And it's a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends the angels upon the ones who are worshipping. And it's a place where the ones who are sitting there making dhikr, reading Quran or seeking knowledge, they have bounty after bounty being descended upon them. That's why in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, بِسَاجِدُهَا That the most beloved places or most beloved lands to Allah جل, places in the lands are the masjid. وَأَبْغَضُ بِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَسْوَاقُهَا And the most disgraced or most disliked places in the lands are the marketplaces because in the marketplaces the malls a lot of cheating takes place a lot of misguidance takes place and in general you find people not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the author he said and when the person is exiting from the masjid they start or they the first step they take is with the left foot and they said like they said in the dua for entering they say bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah except that they replace the words and they say oh Allah open up for me the doors of your provisions the doors of your uh, bounties so when the person leaves the masjid they say bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah oh Allah open up for me the doors of provision so we know that provisions are given to us by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why we say this dua, we bring it to mind that when we leave the masjid, now whatever I'm going to seek from provision in the world is facilitated by Allah Azawajal. In the hadith narrated by, collected by Imam Tirmidhi, who said the hadith is Hassan, the Prophet said, لو أنكم تتوكلون على الله حق توكله لا رزقكم كما يزق الطيور If you were to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a true way of relying, where meaning meaning that your heart is fully attached to Allah and fully certain that Allah will provide for you after, ha after having taken the means. La razakakum kama yarzuku tuyud then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would certainly provide for you the same way he provides for the birds. Taghdu khimasan wa taruhu bitanan that the birds they go out in the morning empty stomach 
and they come back in, in the latter part of the day full of stomach. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for them. The author, he moves on to the prayer and he says, Babu sifati salah. He's now going to talk about the description of the prayer. So the author is going to give a general description of the prayer and then the section after this, he breaks it down into what is a pillar and what is obligatory and what is not from those two sections, from those two categories. However, I'm going to mention to you at each point what is a rukan, what is a wajib and what is sunnah. So first and foremost, what does this word rukan and arkan mean? Rukan and its plural arkan, uh, the English translation would be pillars. But the Arabic is arkanu salah hiya aqwal wal afal allati tatakawwuna minha mahiyatu salah. That the arkan, the rukan, the pillars of the prayer, are those actions and statements which make up the make up the reality of the prayer. So they are the parts of the prayer which make up the prayer and they, the, the prayer cannot be valid without them. So this is an important point to remember. That removing a pillar from the prayer, whether it's done intentionally or unintentionally, invalidates the prayer in both circumstances. If you leave out a pillar of the prayer, something which is a pillar, a rukan, then the prayer is invalidated whether that was done intentionally or unintentionally unless the person فَلَا تَسْقُطُوا إِلَّا عِنْدَ عَجْزِي عَنْهَا unless the person has the inability to do this pillar if the person has the inability to do the prayer to do the pillar then in this situation it's overlooked فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا نَاسِيًا أَوْ عَامِدًا لَمْ تَصِحَ صَلَاتُهُ so whoever leaves it a pillar whether it's unintentional or intentionally then this will uh, render the salah to be invalid. So the pillar is that which has to be there from the prayer, whether it's an action of the prayer, whether it's a statement of the prayer, then uh, it has to be there and it cannot be overlooked in any situation, except for the situation wherein one is unable to perform it. Then we have after the arkan, after that which is known as rukan, we have the wajibat of the salah, that which is wajib. I, I already gave a definition of what is wajib, but the definition that I'm going to give now is slightly different because it relates particularly to the chapter of the prayer itself. Uh, the, the previous definition that I gave in the early lessons was pertaining to the, the usul al-fiqh, the rules of fiqh, how to understand what is a wajib. We said there in that time that the wajib is that action that if you do it, you are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you leave it off, if you leave it off, you are, um, you are, uh, likely to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's something which is obligatory upon you if you do it you're rewarded if you leave it off you're going to be punished but here in this chapter in referring to prayers the wajib means wajibat salah hiya al-af'al wal aqwal allati yalzimu al-musalli fa'iluha athna salah so it is the actions whether it's the action or the statements of the prayer that's you have to do fa'in tarakaha amdan batalat salatuhu However, if you leave these wajibat off, if you leave off the wajib intentionally, it breaks your prayer. وَإِن تَرَكَهَا نَاسِيًا صَحَتْ صَلَاتُهُ However, as opposed to the rukan, as opposed to the pillar, if you leave it off unintentionally, then your prayer is still valid. So we said with regards to the pillar, if you leave it off intentionally or unintentionally, then the prayer in both situations is invalid. Whereas here, the wajib, if you leave it off unintentionally, then it's still valid. It's going to be overlooked if it was done out of forgetfulness. لكن يلزمه أن يجبر هذا النقص في صلاة بسجدتي سحو. However, you will have to do what is known as the sujood sahu, the two prostrations of forgetfulness, uh, which we will study in a few weeks' time, inshallah. طيب. The author he said, وإذا قام إلى الصلاة. If the person, when the person stands up for the prayer. So now he's mentioning the first pillar of the prayer. Standing in the salah is a pillar, it's a rukun. It's something which has to be done. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ And stand up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in obedience. Stand in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the hadith in Bukhari, we have the hadith of Imran ibn Hussein, رضي الله عنه, the companion who said, I heard from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said to me, صَلِّي قَائِمًا فَإِنْ لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ فَقَائِدًا 
pray standing up. So this is a command from the Prophet Sallallahu pray standing up. And if you are unable to pray standing up, then you pray sitting down. And if you can't even pray sitting down, then you pray whilst lying on your side. So praying standing up in the obligatory prayers, in the obligatory prayers is a must. It's not a must in the non-obligatory prayers. In the Sunnah prayer, the Nafal prayer, you can pray sitting down. However, you only have half of the reward if you were able to pray standing up. So again, praying in the obligatory prayers is a pillar. It has to be done standing up. Unless you are unable to do so, then you would pray in any situation that you are able to do so. The author, he says, قَالْ Allahu Akbar. So when the person stands up for the prayer, they say, Allahu Akbar. This is known as takbiratul ihram the first takbir, the opening takbir of the salah. And this is also a rukun, it has to be said. So sometimes people, uh, before we get there, sorry, Imam Ahmed, he collects the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Miftahu salati al-tahur, Miftahu salati al-tahur, wa tahrimuha al-takbir, wa tahliluha al-taslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the key to the prayer is the purification that you make, meaning the wudu. That's what allows you to pray. Wa tahrimuha al-takbir. And that which makes everything outside of the prayer now for you, haram, like the speaking, eating, drinking, etc., is the takbir that we are talking about. The saying, Allahu Akbar. وَتَحْلِيلُهَا And to make everything halal once again for you, from eating, drinking, etc., is to make the taslim, to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So this hadith, it shows us that saying, Allahu Akbar, is something which is a rukan, it's imperative, and we have to say it. So, how do you say it? You say, Allahu Akbar. Bar with the calf, you don't say Allahu Akbar with the ghain, as many people make that mistake. They say Allahu Akbar or Allahu Akbar instead of Allahu Akbar. And some they say Allahu Akbar, they prolong the alif, which then makes it into a question Is Allah the greatest? which is something which is, of course, wrong and we cannot say that. Some people they say Allahu Akbar, they prolong the, uh, the ba with a long alif on it. This is also incorrect as it has a negative meaning. So the correct way to say it is Allahu Akbar. So what does it mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest, He's greater than all that exists. All are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has in no need, zero needs from His creation. All of Allah's creation need Him, but Allah needs nothing from His creation. Whatever is outside of the prayer that we are now about to pray is less important in greatness, less in status, than what we are about to do, which is standing in, in front of the greatest, who is Allah Azza wa So when we say Allahu Akbar, we understand that we are standing in front of the most magnificent, the majestic, the greatest, the one who owns all. And we should try to be cognizant of who we are worshipping when we make this takbir. Like some of the ulama, they said, when you make this takbir, you raise your hands, you are throwing everything else behind you. And you are now focusing solely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you take, for example, the meanings that are found in this part of the verse in Surah Ali Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ Proclaim, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of all that exists. تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you give from your dominion to whoever you so wish. You give from whatever you own this mulk to whomsoever you wish. وَتَنْزِئُ الْمُلْكَ مِمَّنْ تَشَاءُ And you take from this dominion, this what you own from the heavens and the earth, you take from whomsoever you wish. And you raise its status and you give honor to whomsoever you wish. And you bring down in humility and disgrace whomsoever you wish. All good is in your hands. You are with all things able and have complete control over all things. So these are some of the meanings that we should have when we make the takbir Allahu Akbar, it should make us forget everything which is outside of the Salah and make us remember that everything which is outside of the Salah is insignificant in comparison to now what we are about to do standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the tabi'een, um, Sa'id ibn Jubair, rahmatullah alayhi, when he would make wudu, the people would see him become pale and he would start to shake a little bit, just a little bit. They will say to him, what is wrong with you? Why do you get in this situation? And he will say, Atadruna bayna yadayn man sa'aqif. Do you know whom I'm about to stand in front of? So he would have, even from the time of making wudu, this tremendous awareness of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, who he's about to have a conversation with. The author, he says, 
يجهروا به يجهروا بها الإمام وبسائر التكبير. The, the, the Imam, he says this takbir loudly as he does with all of the other takbirs. So the Imam, he says the takbirat of the salah loudly. لِيُسْبِعَ مَنْ خَلْفَهُ In order that the ones who are behind him, the ones in the early rows that are behind him, not right behind, so he doesn't have to scream the takbir. He says it only loud enough so that he can hear and the ones that are in the first row behind him or the first few rows. وَيُغْفِهِ غَيْرُهُ And other than the Imam, they shouldn't say the takbir loudly in order not to disturb the ones who are praying with them and not to disturb the Imam himself. So the Imam says the takbir loudly and those who are praying with the Imam, they shouldn't say the takbir loudly, they should say it only loud enough to hear themselves. So it shouldn't be that they don't move their tongue and they don't make a sound. No, they should move their tongue and they make a sound but only loud enough so that you can hear yourself. The author he says, وَيَرْفَعُ يَدَيْهِ in the ابْتِدَاءِ in the ابْتِدَاءِ التَّكْبِيرِ إِلَّا حَذْرِ مَنْ كِبَيْهِ أَوْ إِلَى فَرُوِي أُذْنَيْهِ That when the person he makes the, makes the takbir of the ihram, the first takbir, he raises his hands whilst makes, making this takbir. This is sunnah. It's sunnah, something which is recommended to do, but if you were to leave it off, you would not be punished. You would be rewarded for doing it, but not punished for leaving off. So it's a sunnah, and other words that we will use um, which are having the same meaning as sunnah is mustahab. So it's sunnah or mustahab to raise the hands when you make the takbirat al-ihram ila hadri man kibayhi until the position of the shoulders or to the position of the bottom of the ears. The mutaakhirin, the later humbly scholars, they establish that rather what you're supposed to do is that you're supposed to raise the hand like so. So that your, your palm of your hand will be in position with the shoulders and your tips of your fingers will be in position with the bottom of your ears. Okay, so this joins between the two options that the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he gave. And the raising of the hands is well established in the Sunnah in the Hadith of Bukhari, uh, narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. He said, رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قام في الصلاة رفع يديه حتى يكون حد منكبه. I saw the Prophet وسلم, when he would stand up for the prayer, he would raise his hands until it would be to the state of his shoulders. And he would also do that when he would make the takbir for the ruku. He, he would raise his hands up to the position of his shoulders. And he would do that also upon raising from the ruku. وَيَقُولُ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ لَمَنْ حَمِدًا وَلَا يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكْ فَالسُّجُودِ And he would say سَمِيَ اللَّهُ لَمَنْ حَمِدًا And he wouldn't raise the hands in the sujood or go into the sujood. وَيَجْعَلُهُمَا تَحْتَ سُرَّتِهِ The author, he says that the person puts their hands under the belly button. This is a sunnah, that the person puts their hands under the belly button. Many beginning students of knowledge and many people who don't have established etiquettes when it comes to seeking knowledge and discussing knowledge, they get into very fiery debates and very heated debates as to where the hands should be put. So they debate that it should be put on the chest or above the chest or below the chest or on the stomach or below the uh, navel. And what happens is that they have these fiery debates and they lose that which is a worship. They lose out on that which is an obligation. The obligation is that one should have the ties of brotherhood and sisterhood. So over a sunnah, over that which is not even an obligation, they start debating and have these fiery arguments and they cause themselves to lose a wajib, that which is an obligation, which is to keep unity wherever one can keep that unity. So, for example, Sheikh, Abdul, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Abdul Aziz al-Jabreen, he mentioned, for example, that many of the scholars, they say that, and including Imam Ahmed, they say that the person has the choice where he wants to put the hands. Why does he have the choice? Because all of the hadith on this situation, according to Imam Ahmed, are not authentic. Whether the person puts the hand on the chest, or the person puts the um, hands above the navel or below the navel, the person has the choice. Okay? And in fact, Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawair, Hafidhahullah, may Allah preserve him, in his, in his explanation of this book, he said that Imam Ahmed said that the hadith of Wa'il ibn Hujr, which states that the hands are placed on the chest, is munkar. Munkar meaning that it has a very severe weakness in the hadith. And he mentioned this in his explanation of Umdatul Fiqh. And Allah knows best. So we're saying that it's sunnah to place your hands uh, under the belly button. And if you were to place it in another place, 
based upon what you believe to be correct or what your other teachers have told you to be correct then that's well and good and you can change your opinion as your journey increases you have the ability to look into the evidences this will take you about 20 years of hardcore study uh, to be able to arrive to your own opinions and then you can do as you see fit as for now we follow what the imam is saying um, which he took from imam ahmed and many of the other in fact the majority of the ulama they say that the hand should be placed uh, either above the navel or below the navel any case it's a sunnah. Uh, the author he said, وَيَجْعَلُ نَذَرُهُ وَيَجْعَلُ نَذَرَهُ إِلَى مَوْضِئِ سُجُودِهِ And the person, he looks with his eyes to the place where he's going to prostrate. So you look to your eyes with the place, you're going to prostrate. One of the tabi'een, one of the students of the companions who is a famous tabi'i, uh, his name was Muhammad ibn Sirin, and this uh, has been collected by Imam ibn Kathir. Who said, Can Asabi Rasulullah Absarum ila Sama Fisola? That the companions of the Prophet, وسلم, they used to when they were praying, some of them raised their eyes up into the sky, look at the sky. So when the verse from Allah was revealed in the Quran, Qad certainly successful are those believers who have tranquility and concentration in their prayer and humility. Khushu has all of these meanings. Uh, they then began to look down to the place of prostration in their prayer with humility so the author is saying that it's sunnah that you should look upon the place when you are praying uh, where you are going to make the prostration and Shaykh Abdul Salam al shawair he mentioned in, in his explanation that there's four types of looking the first of them is which is mustahab or allowed which is that you look uh, which is recommended you look at the place of your sujood as we've just mentioned or at your finger when you are in the tashahud what is mubah what is permissible is for you to look in front of you towards the qibla what is makru what is disliked makru is to look to the left or the right with your eyes and what is a more severity makru more severity disliked more severely disliked is to turn your head to the left to the right or the left and what is haram for you to do in terms of looking is to turn your body to the right or the left because that means you are turning away from the Qibla. So again the author, he said it's sunnah for us to look to the place of sujood. I think I'm going to stop here inshallah rather than to rush through. We started 10 minutes late for whatever reason inshallah. Hopefully next week we can start on time to cover more material. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this action from us and to reward us immensely anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan and if you have any questions on what we've taken so far then feel free to ask inshallah